We decided that we just had to be ourselves every single day, whether the cameras were there or not. We weren't going to put on an act for anybody. And, and we just almost, after, even after the first two or three weeks, you, you forget the cameras are there. My guest today is a gent who is a master promotion whisperer, a 352 aficionado who's repeatedly been able to paratroop into a club and make dreams come true, finding a way to lead his players his team and the fans into the promised land, a.k.a. Nirvana, a.k.a. whatever football division is above the one they currently find themselves in. He is a bloke who, in Welcome to Wrexham, taught the world the life truth that the National League is the hardest league to get promoted out of. Dude made it clear it probably would have been easy for Joe Pesci to get promoted in Goodfellas than it would be to get out the bloody National League. Yet he pulled it off like a footballing Houdini, leading mighty Wrexham back into the big time after 15 seasons in exile. And so, in the past year, he's gone from maybe being recognised in a supermarket in Reading to having his own page on IMDb. And ahead of the Wrexham USA invasion, summer 2023, in which the club will sweep our nation from sea to shining sea, it's an honour to welcome Mr Phil Parkinson. Thanks, Roger. We've got a game tomorrow, so then we, we're travelling to London tomorrow evening and, and flying out on Sunday. So, yeah, just a bit of organisation, some final detail in terms of preparation, but we're all set for hopefully a great trip. When you say a great trip, I've got to say, Phil, you're slightly underselling it. Because you and I are talking days before, now proudly Football League once again, Wrexham, starts its pre-season. And what a pre-season this promises to be. Phil, let's put it this way. In 247 years of American history, I believe your mob might be the very first League Two team to undertake a nationwide coast-to-coast -coast tour of the United States of America. A bit like the Welsh version of planes, trains and automobiles. Phil... Really, how ready do you feel for all the madness that is to come? Yeah, I mean, we're prepared as we can be, and uh, it's very exciting for, for, for all of us. I mean, you do have to pinch yourself sometimes. You know, a couple of two and a half years ago when the owners came in and the, all the problems the club has, has had to, to be embarking on the US tour with the first game against Chelsea in front of over 50,000 fans is it, really it is surreal for us. So, yeah, it's um, it's one of those pinch yourself kind of situations, and um, I think it'll only hit home to us when we actually ar arrive in the US. It's flabbergasting what you are about to experience. I mean, we do need to note: a couple of years ago, Wrexham's pre-season included away matches against six-tier Curzon Ashton and the semi-pro outfit Kevin Drudes, but your Wrexham. Mighty Wrexham are about to match up two Premier League giants, Chelsea and Manchester United, on this journey. You sold out, as you mentioned, North Carolina's 51,000-seat Keenan Stadium in just four days. And these matches will be broadcast nationwide on ESPN. Wrexham, they are the biggest, smallest super team in the world. Just the, the amount, I know you know the amount of support and enthusiasm that exists. Like rationally, and, and I think you know it approaches kind of K-pop, BTS levels of madness. Do you really have a sense of what you're about to engage with here? The extent to which Wrexham locals and longtime supporters, but also fans in the United States, uh, are going to experience in the next couple of weeks with you? Yeah, well, obviously we uh, had a, a vets team um, go out to the tournament in North Carolina, so. You know the the lads who were there have come back and said that they were like taken aback really with the support they had in in America and um, you know the, the Dave Jones, the first team coach who was who ran that trip for us, said you know you, you're going to be surprised when you get out there. Personally, when I was on holiday in Europe um, in the summer with my wife, there was a lot of American tourists in the in the same. Uh, islands I was visiting and I had loads of Americans coming up to me in restaurants talking about Wrexham which was fantastic so that was uh, very very new you normally as a manager you go away and you do bump into to supporters from from clubs you've managed etc but to have a lot of American people coming up to me talking about Wrexham and telling me how much they enjoyed the the games and all the detail I knew about all the players and all the key moments I was yeah it was, it was a bit of a, uh, a shock, but it was, it was equally great. Do you know a lot about the United States? Have you spent much time here? 
Um, I've been to New York holidays and Florida when my my children were younger, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it. So I have not I've not travelled. So it's just you know a great you know great opportunity really for for everybody at the club to to experience that and travel around the US. And we are you know generally you know really excited for it and uh, can't wait to get out there. God, it's just going to be you and and. Paul Mullin, like Thelma and Louise, careening across the United <laughs> States. What city are you most looking forward to seeing, experiencing, and why? When we get to LA, I mean, obviously the Hollywood kind of glitz and, and glamour. I don't know, just just to be around that and just uh, sample that's very exciting. And you know, if, uh, myself and Steve, who's sister manager, our families are coming out as well to not on the flight with us, but having separate holidays. So they're going to join us in LA. So I'm really looking forward to that, and it's. Um, you know, great opportunity for our families as well to 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 come away with the team and and, and share the experience. I can't wait for you to get a cheesesteak at Jim South Street. I do swear the secret of life is contained somewhere in there, along with the whiz wit. What's it like for you, Phil, personally vying tactically against Premier League managers Eric Ten Hag, Mauricio Pochettino? Yeah, you know, I've been fortunate in my career to come up against managers of that level at times in, in cup competitions and yeah that's where you want to be tested and equally for the players you know having to go up levels as we did this year in the FA Cup against Sheffield United and, and Coventry and you know when you look back at those games uh, Sheffield United went on to get promotion to the Premiership Coventry missed out in, in the playoffs so they were great tests for us and, and you know g- generally when we went into the Coventry game in particular you know, myself and Steve and the rest of the staff said, oh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we cope with that higher level of play, that the, the tactical um, adaptations within the game, but also the, the extra physicality of teams at a higher level. And um, obviously we came through those tests really well. We were pleased. Um, this is a whole new different level with, with Chelsea. Um, but yeah, let, let's uh, go into the game and, and give a good account of ourselves, which I'm sure we will. How much do you focus on the score? You mentioned that Manchester United closed door game yeah. last year. It was 4-1 United. But in pre-season, you know, in the Football League, let's say three points is three points. But in pre-season, yeah. wins and losses, they don't mean anything. What, what for you is the measuring stick for success? Yeah, just um, level of performance, really. And like you rightly say, results aren't everything. They aren't the be-all and end-all in in pre-season but equally if we have an eight aside in training the lads want to win you know it's very competitive so you know games are, are, are going to be competitive especially with the level of crowds that we've got but the most important thing is that the physical data at the end of the game when we analyze it in the evening that you know we're where we need to be individually and collectively as a team we know the targets we, we need to hit to be prepared for the new season let's talk about some of those specific marks Paul Mullin super Paul Mullin that Merseyside born goal god Wrexham's number 10 banged in 46 goals in all competitions last season <laughs> including two in that delirious win against Boreham Wood to secure promotion to League 2 and he's thrived at this level before. Top scorer in League Two for Cambridge United before he arrived at Wrexham. How good can he be? What level can Paul Mullin thrive up to in your mind? Obviously, he had that great season, 32 goals, and um, turned down his contract at Cambridge. And I think teams were looking at him and saying, well, you know, he's only really had that good season in his career. Is it just a one season wonder type scenario? But we kind of looked at it a bit deeper than that and thought that the is the reason he scored the goals that year was the balance of the team suited his style of play and when you go back to his previous clubs he was often played out wide or up front on his own in positions which is not going to get the best out of Paul so you know we we were able to to sign Paul up but obviously we're, with an understanding we had to kind of balance the team around him to create chances for opportunities for him uh, where we knew he would thrive so you know I think, like any strikers, if you get the right structure around Paul, you know he can play, uh, he can keep progressing as a player. I've no doubt about that. And the best benchmark for him, it, and the people who've watched the games, was the FA Cup games because he came up against some really, really good defenders, particularly against Sheffield United, and he gave them a lot of problems in those particular games. So yeah, I, you know I've got, I'm excited to see Paul in this division. Um, he's a great lad. He, he's he's not just a 
he, he's not the superstar striker who's a difficult player to handle at all. He's, he's a real team player in the dressing room and in training. And uh, yeah, he's been a great sign for us. And you know, I'm really looking forward to him this year to, to see him go up another level in terms of his performance. Let's talk about the single greatest goalkeeper ever to storm YouTube, Ben Foster, a former number one at Watford and West Brom, famously came out of retirement to join Wrexham at the end of the season and has now returned on a one-year contract. He beautifully said, signing at Wrexham, quote, felt like home. What does he have to do to stay ahead of number two keeper Rob Lainton? Yeah, I mean, Ben's um, you know, he's a top-class goalkeeper and... Um, you know, he's come back last year. He joined us and he hadn't played for a year. And after two days training, he played against York City at home and, and was excellent. This year, he's got a chance to have a pre season with us, um, which is only, you know, can be beneficial for him. Um, but his standards are very high, Ben. And um, you know, I've said before in the press that, you know, of course, Ben has a lot of media interests away from, from the club, but he's great at separating that from day to day training. And when he walks in, into the racecourse ground on a morning. Um, he's the first in, um, uh, in the gym straight away, on the training pitch. He trains 100% every time he's on that training pitch and, and that's the mark of a, a true professional. This is not just pre-season, Phil. The transfer window, and I don't need to remind you of this, is also wide, wide open. We hear Kylian Mbappe might be available. And welcome to Rex and Regulars. Now, just how involved you are, you're the instigator of the Ollie Palmer move, signing in from yeah. Wimbledon, January 2022, for a club record £300,000, made an immediate impact, you know, scoring crucial goals along the way. As you approach this transfer window, on the back of last year's successful campaign, how do you balance between wanting to strengthen the squad, but also not wanting to disrupt the chemistry mm. you've developed with and amongst the current players? Obviously, when we built the squad over the last uh, couple of years, we, we've aimed to, towards building a squad which could grow and travel on this journey with the club. And a lot of the players, I believe, are more than capable of, of progressing into this division and, and the next. So the squad, I feel, is strong. Um, we've got players who are going to be new to this division, like Jacob Mendy, for instance. Um, but you know, I feel he's got all the qualities to, to flourish at this next level and you're right in what you say that the challenge is for us that to add in certain areas while not disrupting the fantastic spirit we've got because we feel one of our strengths is the dressing room and I certainly won't bring in be bringing the player in who will disrupt that so it's a very careful selection process and um, you know sometimes the players we want we can't get because clubs won't sell them or they're just asking for you know ridiculous fees but other times you know over the summer I've met players and and just thought no you're not right for this group so yeah at the moment how, how do you know some, that how, how do you test that um yeah no it's just it's just where they are in their, their career you know what stage of the career they're at what what's the motivation to, to play um like yeah. all the tests you do yeah. there, because it is, you know, you're signing them to do a job on the field, but also signing up for what's become like Ted Lasso meets Hard Knocks. And it, you know, the, I think there was a, Elliot Lee said this morning in an interview, it was beautiful. He said the surreal at Wrexham becomes normal. You've got the cameras, you've got the spotlight. Like, how do you, do you have a, like a, a test? No one's watching this, Phil, so you can tell me. Like, do you have a little secret test that you do to make sure the headspace uh, yeah. of the individual you're trying to sign is right to thrive no. on camera and on field. Yeah. No, it's, it's, first of all, it's just building up a profile of any potential signings. And I always go and meet the player myself, you know, some, you know somewhere, have a coffee, you know, in a quiet hotel somewhere and sit down and, and get to know the player, get an understanding of, of them and the background, and et cetera, and just build an overall picture of, you know, of the, the playing abilities, but the personality, character, et cetera. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that's kind of what what we do. We, we brought in Will uh, Boyle yesterday, and I think he he fits um, ticks all the boxes for what we're looking for in terms of the criteria for, for a new signing. Need to ask you: You are travelling across the United States of America. How far away are Wrexham from signing their first American player, or even an American prospect? Because yeah. I don't like to give Rob and Ryan ideas, but that would be next level marketing yeah. madness. 
No, I think the the rules have changed. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes. This over the last month, <laughs> so there is, there is more flexibility, and we you, are. So that, you, at, you can now sign foreign players, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we ha- have been looking at, um, you know, uh, cr- across the world, really, just because a lot of agents, as soon as the rule changes, instantly, you know, the phone rings with, with potential players. So, yeah, we're exploring that. Have we identified a player we feel is the right fit? at the right money no the answer to that is no but we certainly haven't ruled it out um, but equally I think what you find when you're looking in the, the, those markets the, the the strength and the structure of football um, in the UK is very strong so a player from abroad might think oh go and play in division two you know I should be in the championship but in reality you know it is, it's very very strong the pyramid system so it's Judging players in different leagues around the world, and um, yeah, we are looking at that. Um, and if someone comes available, I'm sure we'll we'll make a move. This guy, this guy's ready. Like Paul Mullin, <laughs> same area. I can probably give you, I can probably give you a good five minutes a season. Yeah, that's um, it. <laughs> the, the way you make it sound, you are Wrexham. Are like the Real Madrid of the lower leagues. Like every agent, every everybody is trying to get their talent into you. But in terms of that star studded nature, I've got to ask you this. Is it true you came out of the locker room toilet and just slammed into Will Ferrell just standing it? I spoke to, to Will Ferrell in my office, actually, before the game. He came in for a chat. Um, yeah, so just, um, yeah, just came in and just had a chat with him really about football. And he was uh, yeah, very knowledgeable, actually, about the game. He'd been watch uh, a couple of games already. And I think he was going to a premiership game the next day. Uh, but just had a really good chat with him. He was asking me about the team and you know knew about the players and yeah, it was really Ferrell, interesting. Ferrell wants to be your American player, uh, Phil. Well, Ferrell <laughs> will watch his interview yeah. and Ferrell will be getting yeah. his agent and be like, "Get yeah. me into that Wrexham squad." Yeah. But, yeah, I think oh. I think the wages might be a problem with that one. <laughs> <laughs> your Wrexham have already been named by bookmakers as four to one favourites to yeah. win League Two ahead of former National League nemesis Stockport and Mighty Knotts County. 46 games lie ahead, though. You know well, you really do, that the level of play is going to go up. Mm-hmm. And as good as this Wrexham squad is, I mean, you have experience after experience that tells you it's not always going to be sunny in North Wales. How do you train your players to prepare them to, to handle something they didn't really have to grapple mm-hmm. with last season, which is adversity you know seasons in 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 mm. football leagues always have dips in them in a in a way yeah. last campaign's runaway uh, raw just didn't can you do you mentally prepare your players for that three or four match slide in mid-january to ensure that you can bounce back yeah um, i think you know last year's promotion you know wasn't an exception like you, you rightly say that in other teams I've played in or managed, even the successful season, you you have periods where you have to find solutions and you, you things don't go your way. So, yeah, the lads know that this division is going to be tougher. You know, the way I can explain it to everybody is that the the top teams in the National League, the top five or six, would hold their own in, in League Two, but all the games in League Two are going to be of the standard of when we play Chesterfield and Notts County. You know, there'll be no games like a Maidstone at home and games where you, you feel if you're right at, at the races, you can win comfortably. Every game is going to be tight uh, and we've got to get the detail right in our performance, you know, set plays, organisation with them without the ball. And that detail becomes even more important. But we're working towards that and, you know, we've got... You know, everyone saying yeah, we're favourites and the bookmakers make great, and you know we'll, we'll take that pressure. Um, but equally, you know, we've got to make sure that we put the processes in place to justify that favourites tag. These players, as you say, they have already experienced the early steps of of some hero's journey. Over the past two years, they've tasted victory, surrounded by smoke from burning red flares, as a devoted, burgeoning local and worldwide support dance through the experience of promotion, collective memory making, exercising 15 years worth of almost not quites and traumas, and then thousands more turned out for that bus parade to share those feelings of joy and relief and possibility. It was all capped off by that all-expenses-paid trip to Vegas, clubbing, pool parties, and really just wondering if Ollie Palmer would ever put his shirt back on. With all that behind you, 
What's your big picture message for this season ahead? The theme that you're trying to drill into these players? Yeah, well, first of all, it's uh, to, to remain humble. Um, and, and grounded and uh, separate the Vegas and, and the Hollywood element we, which we embrace but separate that from the, the day-to-day work we, required and that's what we've done all along and, and also accepting there is commercial responsibilities for the club um, as the season goes on but not use them as, as an excuse understand that's part and parcel of, of the club's profile at the moment so yeah, that's where we are—a continuation of what we've we've done over the last couple of seasons. But you know, I always say to the lads that just remember we're representing a working-class town in Wrexham, and people who pay hard-earned cash to watch us play. And you know, I never ever want to lose sight of that—the the supporters who follow us up and down the country to and, and pay a lot of money to do that. And, and we've got a responsibility to represent them the right way. You mentioned the hard-earned cash. You mentioned you know the turning up in person to support this team at Wrexham's home ground, Stoke Kairos, the Stoke race course, now even more impregnable after being named after the world's slowest brewed cold brew coffee. And it has been an absolute fortress. This is an incredible stat. Since you became manager, Phil, Wrexham have only lost twice at home. They dropped just two points there last season. But that huge spotlight on the club, the huge target, the cameras, does every away match now become a banner occasion? Does it feel like playing 22 finals against teams who want to take down the TV stars, who want to make Rob McElhenney curse on camera? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. I mean, last year that... Every away game, it was the club's biggest crowd of the season, whether it was Bromley or, or Woking. And, uh, but we kind of got used to that in a way. And the teams, you know, we said, look, teams are going to raise the game against us, but we've got to be ready for that and, and go up another level all the time. And, um, you know, we can't get back on the coach and say, and make excuses or moan about it. We, we know what to expect. So we know what we're going into this season. If you look in this division this, this summer, there's a lot of teams who've invested quite heavily in the squad, squads and I feel it's because as a Knox County have joined the party and, and they're thinking you know that those two are good sides and, and we need to improve so there's been a lot more investment than you normally would have a lot of people are saying that um, Division 1 teams Division 1 looks weaker for, for their normal standard but Division 2 is going to be strong this year so yeah we'll be ready for it um, when the time comes and, and preparations at the moment are, are where we want them to be After pre-season The real journey begins. A a truly gruelling 46-game long odyssey. It goes up to Barrow, down through Crawley Town, takes you to that dread fortress, Notts County. And you are the right man to ask this, because you, bloody hell, Phil, you have wizarded four different clubs, Colchester, Bradford, Bolton, now Wrexham amongst them, to promotion, the dreams. I mean, the teams you've managed... What's the one thing they've had in common? Something, something essential in their DNA that lead them to cross that finishing line? Yeah, good, good dressing rooms, good characters. Um, I think that's key. And you know, when you kind of speak with other managers, and we had a EFL managers meeting you know, recently, and the amount of times you know when we we're having a coffee before and after the meeting that everyone's trying to get a good dressing room. Now, it's so important because, like I say, it's a long, long season, a lot of travelling together, a lot of trials and tribulations along the way, um, a lot of games where things might not go your way, and you've got to respond as a team. Um, you know, individuals might be out the team, and you're looking for them to conduct themselves the right way. So throughout the season, you need good people, good characters, of course, quality and match winners are absolutely key. But the core of success. Um, is having the right spirit in the dress room and uh, that's what we aim to maintain. That's why you've got to get Feral in there, box-to-box midfielder, <laughs> character. Just get him in there for the crack. You're a very humble man, Phil, because the one element you didn't mention in the season is what a manager can do. And mm. I've got to acknowledge, your team talks, Phil, have become legendary because of your, I don't know what the right word is, I say enthusiasm. I mean, I, I, when I feel down, sometimes I'm going to be candid. I keep on my desk one of your team talks and I read it to myself because it's almost Churchillian in the way you can engage and motivate. January 22nd, 2022, Wrexham away at Yeovil Town. 
1-0 down after 40 minutes. The Glovers had so many chances to increase that lead. And at half-time, Phil, you stepped on, you stepped up and just said, and I quote, it's a f- disgrace, an absolute f- disgrace. We f- turned up thinking we're going to f- stroll around, we'll f- play, we're going to f- beat these, no problem. They're f- first to every ball. They won more f- challenges. They f- won more second balls. They f- be right on that f- ball. Everyone has been loose in possession because that bit has been f- right first and foremost. Can't accept that performance, boys, because let me tell you, I'm f- static it's 1-0 and Phil I need to know do you write these in advance or do you think (laughs) about what you're going to say or does it just emerge speaking in turn speaking in tongues what's the Phil Parkinson creative process here um yeah I think like prior to the game um it's a bit more structured in the messages we want to get across. <laughs> Obviously, we have a team meeting on, on Fridays, and I don't know, you know how many of those team meetings of um, people have seen. But the um, before the game, really, you don't shouldn't need to say too much before the game because the work's been done. But quite often, I just wait to see what the mood's like when the lads come back in off the warm up and pick up on that. Sometimes, you know, they need relaxing a little bit. Sometimes the mood's a bit flat, and you need to crank things up. Um, and then at half time, we just kind of, I just, you know, say what I feel, you know, what I feel is required in any in any given situation. So, um, yeah, you just react into what, what's happened in the first half, really, and you try and affect the performance going out in the second period. And that is, you know, absolutely key because, you know, games don't always go your own way. And, uh, yeah, you've got to make sure that you find a way to, to turn, turn results around. And it worked because Wrexham... Ended up winning that game. Do you remember the score, Phil? 2-1, wasn't it? Oh, it was, yeah. Phil. They got burst to that f- ball and you were f- <laughs> static. Whatever happens this season, I've got to imagine your life is so bloody different now than you would have thought when you answered Rob McElhenney's call to attempt to lull you over the border to the land of dragons. You had that 90-minute phone call with Rob. We never heard your side of it. You're a smart mm. man. But we've got to ask, did you watch the show when it aired? Um, I haven't watched all of it. I've watched the, we watched the first three, and I've watched bits. And I kind of like I just got to the stage where um, all my family were watching it, and yeah, I've watched yeah the major, majority of it. But I haven't I didn't sit down and watch it as it came out. I kind of was letting people tell me what each episode was like before I could uh, put it on. But listen, it was a bit nerve wracking for for everybody at the club because when those episodes were coming out the, the next day we were training and you know I was kind of thinking but there was all, always an element of trust with with the the producers and you know basically we just decided to be ourselves you know there's, you can't be any other way because we, we wanted to be successful um and there was an element of trust with the producers and and they were brilliant and they they, they remain great and we've worked really well together as, as that's part of the team as well a lot of actors hate watching themselves on screen phil the mm. director steven soderberg said that adam driver doesn't watch his films because they make him yeah. too self-conscious about his own acting mm. And I wonder, has that happened to you? If you when you did watch yeah. those episodes of Welcome to Rexon, seeing how you responded on camera, does it ever make you second guess some of the decisions you've made in the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, of course, I think, yeah, nobody likes seeing themselves on, on TV and you do cringe at times. But, <laughs> you know, the, the most important thing, you know, myself and Steve and the rest of the staff could do, you know, we had to, give it everything we could to gain promotion and we decided that we just had to be ourselves every single day whether the cameras were there or not we weren't going to put on an act for anybody and and we just almost after even after the first two or three weeks you you forget the cameras are there you really do and people told told me that prior to you know when it started and I didn't think that would happen but you really do so what the you all saw was just the true reality of how we were conducting ourselves in the dress room and on the touchline um yeah and it will continue to be that way because um sometimes things have got to be said um and you know you know we're going to do everything in our powers this year to to try and get promotion again this season starts august 5th for wrexham at home against mk dons and Phil Parkinson, you are on the cusp of an epic journey. We will all be watching. We'll all be watching twice, once in real time, once when it's refracted back uh, on Hulu. 
But what's your message to Wrexham Nation about all that lies ahead? Yeah, just uh, keep enjoying the journey with us because it's um, it's been incredible so far. I do feel that the uh, the story is is at the beginning uh, for for this club because the potential is huge. That, you know, hence the, the reason Rob and Ryan bought the club because of the catchment area. Um, you know, there's so much work still to be done at the club. You know, this last few weeks we've announced about the academy structure um, coming into place, which is so important for this football club in, in years to come. And you know, we needed to get back in the EFL to be able to do that. So yeah, it's the start of a journey. There's many, many exciting times um, ahead, I'm sure. And um, in, in a football club that everybody's got to stick together. The supporters, everyone who works at the club has got to stick together and uh, fight every single game You know, to, to be the po- best we possibly can. And uh, I always stress that in all the, the press interviews that make reference to how good the supporters have been and our supporters in the ground at home, even when we've been getting beat. Honestly, the, the Bournemouth game was conceded in the first seconds but stayed with us and have been incredibly supportive to, to myself and, and this team who understand what we want and um, standards are high and uh, you know we'll keep uh, keep them there and hopefully it leads us to success. I, I am genuinely fascinated to hear what you've learnt from this unique Wrexham journey. You, you, you were grinding your way uh, through the different levels of leagues. You, you, you've often done the hard yards as a football manager you were sacked by Sunderland inside a year. And you know, that, that moment is always a, just a one of darkness for any manager. Um, and then Rob McElhenney calls, offers you this, this surreal, quite unorthodox opportunity. You took it. And well, you're now about to embark on a tour of the United States of America to play Manchester United and Chelsea before a truly adoring Wrexham nation. I don't think you are quite aware of just how massive the club are over here. And I say that seriously. If you could go back to yourself in those lows and give yourself a piece of life advice that you've learned from this Wrexham experience, Phil, what would it be? Um, I think for me personally, it's about keep saying things in your stride uh, be yourself be yourself you know that's uh, don't try and be something you, you're not and uh, yeah just um, be respectful to everybody and you know grateful of the the incredible situation in myself and, and everybody's in and do the absolute most we can to, to, to make the best of this 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 great opportunity so yeah but I think the most important thing is to, to remain humble and uh, just be myself and uh, that's what I've tried to do and uh, we'll continue to do this season Phil and also sign Will Ferrell Um, to you Phil to your family to your team your fan base Godspeed as you tour our nation Um, we cannot wait to watch next season courage listen to the full version of this podcast and all our podcasts wherever you get your pods but first subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage.